Greetings from Camino Lutheran Church on the 12th Sunday in the season of Pentecost. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. We continue our worship together with the confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who greets us in this and every season, whose word never fails, whose promise is sure. Amen. Now let us confess our sins in the presence of God and of our neighbor. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned, we have hurt our community, we have squandered your blessings, we have hoarded your bounty. In the name of Jesus, forgive us and grant us your mercy. Righteous God, we confess that we have sinned, we have failed to be honest. We have lacked the courage to speak. We have spoken falsely. In the name of Jesus, forgive us and grant us your mercy. God is a cold cup of water when we thirst. God offers boundless grace when we fail. Claim the gift of God's mercy. You are freed and forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God of all peoples, your arms reach out to embrace all those who call upon you. Teach us as disciples of your Son to love the world with compassion and constancy, that your name may be known throughout the earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our first reading from the Hebrew Scriptures comes from Isaiah chapter 56, verses 1 and then 6 through 8. Thus says the Lord, maintain justice and do what is right, for soon my salvation will come and my deliverance be revealed. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath and do not profane it and hold fast my covenant. These I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Thus says the Lord God, who gathers the outcasts of Israel. I will gather others to them besides those already gathered. Word of hope, word of life. Thanks be to God. Thank you. 
Our second reading is taken from Romans chapter 11, verses 1 to 2, and then 29 to 32. Paul writes, I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable, just as you were once disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they have now been disobedient in order that, by mercy shown to you, they too may now receive mercy. For God has imprisoned all in disobedience, so that he may be merciful to all. Word of hope, word of life. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel from the 15th chapter of Matthew, beginning with the 10th verse. Jesus called the crowd to him and said to them, Listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached him and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if one blind person guides another, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, Explain this parable to us. Then he said, Are you still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this is what defiles. For out of the heart come evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done to you as you wish. And your daughter was healed instantly. Word of hope word of life. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, bless the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart, that they are pleasing to you and faithful to your gospel. Help us in our struggle within this text. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to begin with a story, a story that a parishioner had told about sitting outside the, the office here at the church. And what I ask is that you hang with me all the way through the story and my response at the end. And they overheard a conversation of somebody who'd come to the door. They looked and they were telling another parishioner about this, that, hey, I saw this person come, uh, someone that I would have been very suspect of. They don't necessarily belong here. Um, and was at the door and was talking with the pastor and came up and said, hey, can you please help me? My daughter's in the hospital. She's been hit uh, by a car. We don't know the doctor said they don't know whether she's going to live or, or whether she's going to die. We're not we're just sure sure exactly what, what's going to happen. Can you please come and can you at least come and sit and, and pray with her? And, um, and then I, I looked and I said, well, you know, I, I'm, not in, I'm employed by the church and you're not a part of the church. And so I don't think that I can go, it's not my job really to go out and to, to, to pray with your daughter. And he looked back and he said, can you please keep, please, please, it's not going to take much of your time. 
Um, I, I know I haven't been around here. I know you don't know who I am, but can't you just please at least come help me with this and help for my daughter, for my daughter's sake? And, you know, and I just looked and I said, look, here's the, here's the reality. Uh, these folks pay me here at this church. And uh, these are good church folks who expect me to be here present for them all the time, not to be out and about for somebody I don't even know who obviously hasn't even donned the doors of the church because I don't know who you, who you are. Now, <laughs> hearing that story, a story that did not really happen, but a story I borrowed from Pastor Nathan Nettleton out of uh, Victoria, Australia, South Yari Baptist Church. I'd mentioned him last week. Um, he tells this story um, and his, his sermon on this text. And in fact, what I'm going to be using today is a big chunk of, of what he wrote. Um, but how would you feel about that? If that's really what you overheard me saying, I hope you'd be appalled and disturbed by it, that I would treat somebody like that who comes to the doors of the church as if I'm only supposed to care as a pastor for the people that are within the walls of the church, as if the church is just that which is within the building and that the church is not God's church that's out all over the world. And when someone comes and has a need that we respond, well, I share that story because it may seem similar to what we have in our gospel reading for today. You hear Jesus' words in this text, and this is a difficult text, and perhaps you hearing me read the gospel ahead of time left you feeling like that is just disturbing what you, you sense that you're hearing Jesus say here, um, especially to this, to this young gal who comes up in need and saying that her, her daughter is tormented by a demon. Can you please come and help me? And so what is going on there? So I, I'm sitting in front of books in this picture, this Rembrandt picture of the Apostle Paul, and he's leaned over, and I keep, every once in a while I look back at that, and what I see in that is just some intensity of what's going on and his struggle of oh, his ministry and what he's doing, or just struggling with what is the faithful response here, or, or in the midst of these pieces, some type of anguish that he's wrestling with. And I have to be honest, this text for myself and for many pastors uh, preaching is one of those texts that leaves you feeling like that. And so I want to, I want to put some, you've noticed over the last couple of weeks, I've been putting kind of possibilities out there for you to wrestle with um, and to think about rather than a, this is what it is type thing. And I'm going to do that again. And as I said, I'm borrowing just massive chunks and reading straight some of the stuff um, from Nathan Nettleton's sermon because I think he gives us some pieces to wrestle with on this text. Now the setting within this text is that is that Jesus' disciples had been called to the carpet or, or the religious leaders came to Jesus and they said, hey, how come your disciples aren't washing their hands before they eat? Uh, they're not staying pure. And purity, purity laws, purity codes around food and preparation and those things were huge in the Jewish community in Jesus' day. They were a reflection of, of, of remaining pure, remaining in right relationship with God. And so Jesus comes at the beginning of our text in those first several verses. What do we got? Verses 10 through 20, 10 verses. And he, he says when his disciples come up and say, hey, when, when you brought some of these things up, the disciples weren't thrilled about it. And he says, well, because it's not what's on the outside that defiles a person. Because if you look about it, it's not what you eat. And we think about the process, and he explains it straight up. When you eat something, it goes in the mouth, down through the stomach, out into the toilet and out into the sewers or wherever it goes from there. But what defiles a person is what comes up out of the heart. For out of the heart come evil intentions. Intentions. It doesn't say that there are actions that are being acted upon, but these evil intentions that are coming up out of there. And so it's not that our traditions, it's not that the purity codes in themselves were, were, were wrong. Um, they did offer a way uh, uh, to engage one's relationship with God, seeking to be pure and to be faithful. Um, but they in themselves were not what makes one faithful. And if you didn't do it, didn't defile you. What defiles you is what's coming out of your heart, these evil intentions. And he lists a bunch of them, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. So there's some of the setup um, for our text then that we have in the second half. That Jesus leaves the place, went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon, which is 
Gentile, Gentile area, non-Jewish area, and just then a Canaanite woman from that region comes out shouting, Have mercy on us, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But first he doesn't even answer. Then the disciples say, She is just driving us nuts. She won't stop. Can't you send her away? And where before he says, No, you give them something to eat in the feeding of 5,000. He says, he looks at her straight and says, look, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So there's this piece that that's who he's sent to. And indeed he was. The people of Israel were to be the bearers of God's word for the whole of creation. The Messiah was to come and gather the people about so that they could be that blessing out into the world. So indeed, the whole of the world to receive the gift of the Messiah and God's blessings of grace and good news were to come through the people of Israel, of whom Jesus was one. But he looks and he says, this is who I'm sent for. And she, yields, she kneels before him, position of worship. She's already called him Lord, son of David. She's already acknowledged him on this high level of Messiah as one who will bring healing to the whole of the world. And he says, look, she says, Lord, just help me. He says, look, it's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. Ooh say more about that term dogs in a little bit it's disturbing jesus what is going on with you why are you treating this woman like this this isn't the jesus that we think about but she looks up and she says yes lord yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table whoa is and jesus says woman great is your faith let it be done for you as you wish your daughter was healed instantly so what is going on with Jesus? Why is he acting like this? Did he have a bad day? Was he angry? Was What's going on? And so this is where I'm going to borrow straight up from Nathan Nettleton several pieces throughout his sermon that I'm going to read to you because I think they might be helpful to us overall in wrestling with this text. He said, first possibility, Jesus is just having a very bad day. I mean, he's been dealing with a lot of sick people. He's dealing with the religious thought police that are always coming. You know, those who come and tell you that's wrong. This is how you do everything in the religious leaders of the day. Um, and now here comes another person. He's trying to get away to some silence. And here comes another piece and just wanting another piece of him. Maybe you've been there where you feel like that, like you're so wiped out and tired. And here's just another person wanting a, a piece of, of you. And he just runs out of patience in that moment and he snaps. But then he finally recovers in his composure and commends her for her great faith because he's willing at some level to listen to her and what she's saying and what she is acknowledging. Yes, I'm outside the, the chosen people. And yet you see, I see that you are, you are the special one that has come from God, who has come to bear grace for the whole of the world, to bring healing to the whole of the world. So Nathan says, the trouble with that theory is that having just said what comes out of the mouth comes from the heart, it doesn't say much for the state of Jesus' heart, does it? What comes out of his mouth is not just words of tiredness and frustration, but words of insult and put, put down. So we wrestle with that in that first possibility, he was just having a bad day. Second possibility, he goes on to say, perhaps what Jesus said isn't all that bad as it sounds. Perhaps in another culture, and with a different tone of voice and a sparkle in his eye, we'd understand that Jesus was not being offensive at all. Well, the problem with that is he calls her a dog. And some scholars have tried to tried to kind of whitewash this uh, thing and make it nice and pleasant. They said, well, the Greek word means puppies. And how can you be angry at puppies, right? That's not a bad thing. Although puppies, some of them are, are just... They, they need the help of, of mom and somebody to take care of them. So even still, Jesus seems to be putting her down. In fact, most Greek scholars accept a translation that's much stronger. But Jesus is calling her a dog, a dog. And I'll say a little bit more about that translation in a bit. Even if you do use the puppies translation, it doesn't help that much to have Jesus playing games with this woman when her need is so serious and her pleas are so specific. Even if he was winking and talking of puppies, it's all patronizing at best. So this idea that it's not as all as bad, it's just the culture and Jesus is playing along, that's not a way to treat another person. Third possibility brings up, 
Perhaps Jesus is a product of his environment. And he tells the story of a friend of his, colleague, who came to Australia from the United States who grew up in the South. And this friend said, until I was about 17 years of age, and these are his words, uh, bef- it was about 17 years of age before I realized that there was any other way of thinking about black people than the racist way of the culture that I grew up in. He wonders if maybe Jesus was in that same spot. But the thing is, every Israel, and every Israelite kid growing up had the sense of others being the enemy, um, that they themselves were part of a chosen race as the people of God, the people of Israel, and that many of those out there were not, and in some cases even looked at them as, as godless and um, not deserving of God's grace and mercy. So with Jesus fully human, and since the Gospels actually tell us that he grew up in wisdom and in favor with God as he grew up, then does it seem unreasonable to think that Jesus would have taken for granted the prejudices of his environment until he was confronted with the need to question them? Middleton goes on, I can't quite imagine Jesus the toddler being aware of the shortcomings of his culture and being able to denounce racism before starting school. He goes on. Eddie saw this story as the moment when Jesus became aware of Gentiles as equally loved by God and equally deserving of the mercy of God. The moment his eyes are open, he repents, has a change of heart, and acts differently from then on. One of the problems with that theory is that Jesus has already healed the servant of a Roman centurion earlier in Matthew's Gospel, but that may just make him even more a product of his age. This time, he's just being sexist and elitist as well as racist. Or it might just mean that these stories are not preserved in chronological order. Okay, that's three different possibilities. Maybe you can see more. But even if we can come up with another explanation that casts Jesus in a more favorable light, we still have to deal with the fact that this woman argued with Jesus and Jesus conceded that she was right and perhaps he was wrong. And that he needed to respond to her with a measure of grace that he initially was withholding for whatever reason, thinking he could. If repentance means a change of heart and a consequent change of behavior, then this story, in this story we see Jesus repenting. Now, it raises a problem for seven of you when you hear about Jesus repenting, doesn't it? The idea of the sinless perfection of Jesus. So he goes on. Or does it? There are two different ways of thinking about human perfection, sinlessness. There's the static view that comes out of Greek philosophy that seeks sinless perfection as the peak of human moral possibility. You have to grow into it, and so you're not perfect until you get there. Alternatively, there is a growth view that comes out of the Hebrew spirituality that sees sinless perfection more as a steady growth towards godliness, a growth that at each new possibility grows in the right direction. So you go back to the story of Eddie, He had argued that up to the point that he had no idea what his racist views were, that they were wrong, he was fine. But the moment that he became aware of his racist views, he was called to repent and change. And it was at that point that when he had the choice that he could move forward in sin or not. In this sense of it being something for which he could be personally culpable. So they go with the idea of a child can't can't, you know, choose whether or not to be influenced by the only environment they know. Middleton goes on. However, from the moment he became aware that there were alternative ways of thinking, he became capable of choice and therefore responsible for the progress of his attitudes. Once he could choose between a racist response to a person and another person, any specific choice for the racist option would have been a sin for which he was personally culpable. The sinless of Jesus did not mean that he didn't inherit the racist assumptions of his culture. Instead, it meant that as soon as he became aware of the alternative, he was able to consistently move beyond these assumptions into greater godliness. Now, if this is the biblical view of Jesus' sinlessness, and it seems to make much more sense of the stories we have, then that is kind of exciting, because that means that the sinlessness of Jesus rather than being something that puts him in an entirely different realm from us, and they're beyond, by beyond our comprehension, is actually something that is a genuine example for us to follow. Sure, we'll make a lot more mistakes than him, and we already have, 
But every time we are confronted with a new challenge to change and grow up and get it right, or at least partly right, we are generally following in the footsteps of Jesus. One thing is for sure, if even Jesus underestimated the grace of God and had to be shaken into recognizing some people as loved by God, you can bet your last dollar that no matter how broad-minded some of us may be, none of us are yet beyond being shocked by who God is willing to love and welcome into the kingdom. So there are some possibilities. What do you think? Where do they fall short? Where do they gain traction? I guess for me, I lean towards that place somewhere, though not spoken clearly there, even in all those. It, whatever was going on, it came to that place. It's like those evil intentions in the heart. Do you bear those out? Do you act upon them? Do you push them? That didn't happen. Jesus was willing to listen and hear, and he responded with God's grace. That is something that we are called to in our daily lives as well. When those who are outside of who we would normally accept or even think maybe accepted by God, when those intentions come up that can do damage to others, what choices do we make? Do we respond with grace? Do we see and become even aware that God can work well beyond the boxes we put God in? I'll leave you to wrestle with that one. Amen. Confident that God receives our joys and our concerns, let us pray for the church, for those in need, and for all of creation. O God, your spirit gathers the church. Shepherd those who are newly baptized and newly ordained in the proclamation of the gospel. Breathe life into ecumenical and interreligious endeavors and support missionaries throughout the globe. 
Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You created the earth and all its inhabitants and declared it good. Clean, polluted skies, seas, and soil provide nourishment to plants and animals and make us aware of our impact on the environment. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You call leaders to bridge differences and practice generosity. Inspire all in authority to protect people in harm's way. Deliver those in bondage. Support fair elections. Provide care for military personnel and veterans and their families. And show mercy to those for whom they have responsibility. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You provide for those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Embrace people who have been rejected because of difference. Heal trauma caused by racism or prejudice. Shield any who are persecuted. <clears throat> Console the dying and heal the sick. We especially pray for Caden, for Zaid, for Ruth, for Kelly and Ivy, Diane Roberts, Roman, Carol Ann, Amy, Alexis, Pam, John, Sharon, Sarah Lynn, Jay and Karen. We pray for Terry, Tracy, Shannon, Jessica, Jeanette, Kelly, Pat, Dick, and Patty. We also remember those named in our bulletin, on our prayer chain, and those we name aloud or in the silence of our hearts at this time. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. O oh God, you journey with us in all of life's transitions. Guide those preparing for baptism, marriage, and retirement. Guide our church council and committees in their vision and ministry. We especially remember Sarah Schlegel and Danny as they were married yesterday. Hold them in their new life together. Guide and lead their steps. And may your mercy always hold them. Safeguard those who travel. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Into your hands, O God, we commend all for whom we pray. In the name of the one who reconciled all creations to himself, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Lord, all these prayers and those we hold in our hearts, we lift up to you together in the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. God of field and forest, sea and sky, you are the giver of all good things. Sustain us with these gifts of your creation and multiply your good, great goodness and graciousness in us that the world may be fed with your love through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.
God who calls across the cosmos and speaks in the smallest seed, bless, keep, and sustain you now and to the end of the age. Amen. Go in peace, share the harvest. Thanks be to God. Welcome to our announcements from the office today. I've uh, got a couple of them, three of them. And the first one is our Benevolence of the Month is uh, Doctors Without Borders. If that's something you'd like to help out with, uh, you can go online and hit the donate button. Or if you send in a check down in the memo, write BOM, Doctor Without Borders. Uh, started back in 1968. They go, it doesn't matter which country, who you are, religious background, ethnicity, uh, they go where there is need to help people. So wonderful, wonderful program um, that, that we want to try to try to help out as we can. So but that's our benevolence of the month. The second piece is I want to remind you again, September 10th is our our gathering day here, Kermano Lutheran Church worship gathering day, uh, but it's not here at the church. We will gather out for God's work our hands day with all the churches in our cluster in the community out at the Stanwood uh, fairgrounds. And that's 10 a.m. September 10. We'll have worship together, followed by a meal, and then uh, we'll have tables set up for some, some service project, hands-on service project opportunities for us to be involved in. So come on out and be a part of that. And then the third one I wanted to put before you, just again, the Aging Mastery class. We have two guaranteed spots left. So we had 15 spots, 13 of those have been filled. So two guaranteed spots left at the time I make this video. If we fill those, we can put you, and you don't get in on time, we can put you on a um, wait list. And if something opens up, then we can let you know. And again, the, this will start over at the Commando Center. We're gonna go as a group, September 26th through November 28th. It's 10 weeks, and it's Tuesdays at one o'clock to 2.30. So it's a 90 minute class. You get a workbook. Uh, we've heard from some of the folks at the in-person worship just how wonderful this class is. Um, and how they wish they had taken it sooner. So if you have more questions, call the office. It is $60, but never let that be something that keeps you from going. Both the Commander Center and us have scholarships available for those who that might be an issue. Just contact me directly and, and we'll take care of it for you. So if you'd like to help out with that or be a part of that, again, the papers are here at the church on the bulletin board, but call in the office and, and let them know um, if that's something you'd like to do. So those are our announcements for this week. God's blessings on all that you do and blessings as you wrestle with that text. That text was a difficult one um, and uh, just put some things before you. So God's peace and blessings as you wrestle with that one.